stories of Sinbad from the 1001 Arabian Nights were the most interesting because the sixth and seventh voyages deal with uh, Serendib, the island of Serendib. One never knows in what context this was written, where the Sinbad was even based on the life of a real man. But yeah, there are some connections, particularly to Gaul. And uh, perhaps uh, it can't be compared to uh, the more complete Rehlav ibn Battuta or something like that, because that is an absolute biographical account. But Sinbad is ever present in storytelling surrounding the island. Going on a journey and seven voyages all over the world, it captures one's fancy. And also there is um, the 10th century historiographical account by Al Masudi called Meadows of Gold and Mines of Gems, which this work was basically a chronicling of history from Adam and Eve until Masudi's period in the 10th century. He also includes a funeral ceremony of a king of Serendib at that point, which the king is uh, cremated in camphor, sandalwood and prepared spices. And he also comments on vernacular musical instruments that could sort of produce effects of laughing and crying. It sees the island of Serendib, you know, it's all this, this process of how one views an island as uh, exotic for its flora, fauna, and it's just distant views of an island connected to a religious tradition as well. In the 15th century, a Persian poet and chronicler by the name of Ashraf states that God created the island of Serendib spices and flowers to make Adam's transition from paradise to earth less painful. It's further steeped in legend and accounts of oral history that say that the tears of Adam, who prayed on one foot for 40 years on the mountain summit, were turned into precious stones, which explain the Islamic tradition for both the single footprint on the mountain summit and the gem mines that surround in the Ratnapura, broadly the Ratnapura region. And I think the serendipitous nature of reaching Ceylon has sort of uh, gone well beyond the Arab world and influenced storytelling on the island or about the island far beyond. <laughs> If you read the Rig Veda or Zend Avesta of the Zoroastrians, or even the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, there were specific instructions given how to build the Ark of the Covenant, right? In the Quran, you don't find any such thing. It's just a clear revelation from God. How did the mosque we have today with its domes and minarets evolve? If you go through, trace the evolution of a mosque, but we know of a mosque, the, the dome, or we call it the kubba, is not an early Islamic innovation. It was inherited from the Byzantines, from the Eastern Roman Empire. So why do we still have it? Because it has assumed a distinctive Islamic form. So it, is, it has been written, and it's a beautiful thing to have a dome and minarets. So most mosques today prefer to retain this traditional Islamic architecture. The star and crescent symbol Today we regard it as a symbol of Islam. For a long period we had no symbol. The Muslim world had no symbol. So when the Ottoman Turks, I believe you know that the Ottoman Turks con conquered Constantinople in 1453 and they made it Istanbul. And what did they do? They borrowed the symbol of the city of Constantinople as the symbol of Islam. Primarily, there was a distinctive Islamic style at one time, the Arabian style which in turn had borrowed from Byzantine and Persian and so on. When the Muslims went to Africa, for example, you will see the mosque there. It's something reflecting the African tradition. Then if you look at in China, on the other side, in the far, in the far east, you will see the mosques some have, sometimes having old mosques, having traditional Chinese architecture. Before stepping to the architectural debate, 
perhaps a historical context of people setting up mosque in a place without a necessarily defined Islamic identity would obviously use materials surrounding them to build because that was what was available. Sailors possibly sailing into the island would have employed materials surrounding them to build these mosques and possibly em employ local builders and artists to design these structures suited to local climatic conditions such as larger mosques with smaller traditional courtyards to protect themselves from the tropical sun. So those would be some of the more practical elements. A notable early sketches of a mosque is one by Barbara Sansoni, done in 63. It's an extremely interesting sketch. It's called Darga Town Mosque Alutgama. The picture itself is sort of very telling in that there are the grave sites just in front of the mosque and then leading to a mosque with not particularly any of uh, the symbols one would associate necessarily with Islamic architecture. The pillars tell a story, the roofing tells another story. But it's interesting that she notes men and boys in the picture all dressed in the fez hat. So that sort of markers of uh, certain traits that have continued and certain architectural styles that have just completely gone out. Um, and also this picture um, comes along with a description in which uh, the authors of the book itself say that it's not necessarily a traditional style of mosque building. In fact, some of its features go against the tenets of the religion. In Sri Lanka, we do have traditional mosques. If you look at that, Barbara Sansoni's book has two mosques. One is a courtyard mosque in Beruala, and the other is the Talapitiya mosque, where there are eyes inviting you to uh, witness the prayers. Both are destroyed now. Okay? Uh, and you get Arab gravestones from the 10th century, which you don't get in Arabia, in both this, in the Talapitiya mosque. You might know in Chatham Street, for example, there was a tile mosque, which is I have seen in my life, but which is no longer there. Then the more recent mosque, like the Dawata Gedra Mosque and the Second Cross Street Mosque and the follow a thing called Indo-Saracenic style, which is uh, an Oriental style which went from drawings by William Daniels, uh, Hodges, they went to England and they influenced things like the Brighton Pavilion, but came back in a thing called the Indo-Saracenic style. So you get the Eye Hospital, the George Wall Fountain, the Second Cross Street Mosque, uh, the Dawata Gahagedara Mosque, all these being influenced by that, okay, which is influence of Mughal monuments going to Europe or in England particularly, and those ideas coming back to Asia. It's an interesting history to the Gulf Fort Miran Mosque, which is also now an extremely popular tourist site. Uh, I mean, this mosque has taken on, I think, a new life as a heritage monument now after Gulf Fort acquiring the UNESCO heritage status. It's said to have been uh, built by um, a merchant from Gulf Fort who had commissioned other mosques as well in its current structure. But the mosque has a notable architectural identity, but it's one of the few mosques which are actually built to uh, face the sacred direction of what is known as the Qibla, which is facing the holy site of Mecca, which is the direction in which Muslims generally pray. So architecturally, it's positioned in that way, which is not common in many mosques. And the structures and design itself, uh, it's supposed to have been built in harmony with surrounding structures. So that's just an interesting sort of way of placing a Muslim religious site in what is a Dutch military fort and how it's sort of the lived histories of the Gulf Fort 
sort of take on different lives. And a notable feature of this mosque, again, posing some interesting questions with regard to cross-cultural influences is its uh, stained glass windows. So the mosque is stained glass windows and wooden flooring. And uh, atop the staircase and adjoining the building is, I mean, again, a story of influential golf fort individuals, uh, building structures, for it has a Muslim cultural center which holds a spectacular view of the golf fort. And uh, right as far as the Ruma Salakanda. So it's a pretty panoramic view. So the mosque is said to have been built in 1909 in its current form. But the numerals painted on the front of the wall of the mosque facing the sea denote the year 1325 Hijri. So it possibly denotes a prayer space that was there far before the mosque structure itself came to be. Probably it had an earlier structure over which it was built. And who knows that particular structure also would have been a bit like this. Because why Baroque? I mean, this is a colonial style evolved with the Catholics who wanted a more dynamic or distinctive architecture compared to the Protestant tradition. So they patronized this and evolved this particular Barak architecture. So how come that came to Sri Lanka? So what were the reasons for it? So perhaps who knows it may have been there from the Portuguese times, the same style. And when the new mosque was built, they would have simply adapted that architecture, probably. Otherwise there is no reason why they would all at once adopt this particular style in 1908 when it was built. By that time it had been a style that was not in, in favour. There is another ancient sailing point in Gaul, which is particularly interesting, which is called Haji Watta. Uh, it's basically along the Magala Bridge in Gaul. It's probably one of the oldest structures associated with sailing from West Asia to Ceylon. It was once a leading prayer space in the area, although now there are far more uh, mosques, larger prayer spaces around, so it's fairly insignificant now. And a tale associated with this structure and the moat behind is particularly interesting because it's attested by many locals that pilgrims headed for the annual Hajj pilgrimage from the entire south of Sri Lanka and would congregate at this point to set sail via the Gaul Harbour. According to the caretakers of the structure, this mosque is as old as the birth of Islam. So, it's an oral history, it's an interesting oral history, and it's quite likely that it was a point for sailors or a sailing point before it became a mosque. And I mean, the architectural setting and uh, materials used are also extremely harmonious with the environment there. It's in stark contrast to some of the other larger mosques there because it's completely in harmony with its environment that one would not even realize that it's a mosque apart from its exterior wall, which I presume is more modern. There's no star and crescent present uh, inside the mosque structure. It's only the exterior wall that has it. I think those two are fairly fascinating examples of two mosques in, from completely different um, historical and uh, architectural trajectories, all within a few kilometers of each other. The southern coastal town of Beerwala attracted many traders of Islamic faith during the 11th century. One such pioneer was Sheikh Sultanul Aulia Ashraf Baliullah from Yemen, who arrived and settled here with few other princes. After managing a thriving business for some time, the Sheikh died and was buried on this hill. After many years, the chief priest of the Maradana Jumma Mosque visited this site. 
Upon climbing this hillock, he fell asleep as he rested under a tree and is said to have had a vision of the sheikh who requested him to build a mosque there. The ancient mosque of Ketchimalay was hence established and has stood there for the past 800 years. Ketchimalay Mosque is quite an old mosque. I would say it's about the 11th century it was built. The third oldest perhaps. You would see the dome is not conspicuous. It's behind. Well, there is some other unique architecture, something like Baroque, but not Baroque also exactly. It's unique. Bayerwale has two mosques, really, not one. One is Ketchimalay, the other is Abrar Mosque. Abrar Mosque is unique in that it is the oldest mosque in Sri Lanka. The oldest standing mosque in Sri Lanka is Abrar Mosque in the Maradana area of Bayerwale. It was built in 920 AD. That's over 1,000 years ago. Still stands. Of course, not the same structure, but the tradition is there. If you look at the picture of the old Abrar Mosque, let's say about 100 years ago, you will find it had no dome. It had no dome. It was a nice structure, solid structure. The South Indian community here, they wanted something new to show that they are a dynamic trading community, perhaps distinct from the other Moors. So what did they do? They wanted their own way. They wanted their own mosque. And they commissioned one local boss called Saibo, Saibo Lebe, to do this. A mason like his father, Saibo Lebe had never stepped outside Ceylon and had no access to any literature on architecture. It is said that Saibo Lebe had to depend on black and white pictures and photographs given to him by the South Indian trading community in Peta, who commissioned the mosque at Second Cross Street. With its mesmerizing red and white candy stripes, 49 minarets, pomegranate domes and a clock tower, the red masjid is nothing short of spectacular. We call it the Samban Court Mosque. Samban Court means we have the Indian traders called Samban Karan, who came from South India. So this particular, com this particular community, they built this mosque in 1908. And it's quite distinct from every mosque you see in Sri Lanka. It's not just that it's large, but even that particular architectural style, the red and white stripes, this particular style, you will see in the Technical College in Maradana. The people then thought it was a modern style and they wanted it to, they wanted that modernity to reflect in this mosque, right? So it had to be different. They want to leave their mark. So they wanted a monument that will stand them, not only in good stead, but also reflect their ability to change and innovate. As I mentioned to you, there, is no, there are no guidelines in the Quran how a mosque should be built. It was up to the Muslims themselves to build mosques the way they Wanted. Of course, mosques have certain basic principles. For example, it should face Mecca. There's a lot of leeway, a lot of scope how you build a mosque. How you build a mosque. You, you can incorporate local architectural traditions, mosaics, then you can have carpets, whatever. You can adorn it the way you want, the way you want. And of course, in keeping with that particular environment, you compare one mosque to another. Right? There's a lot of difference, a lot of variety. That's the beauty of it. So man's artistic expressions are put into its best form in the mosque, right? The aesthetic values are all represented based on the, the aesthetic values of the, the person who, the architect, the person who designed it, or the larger community who wanted it like that, or the larger ethnic group who wants it to reflect their culture. 
all that can be incorporated into the mosque. This is the beauty of not having too much guidelines on how you build a mosque. So there's a lot of scope for improving and making it acceptable to a lot of people. Anything that would in no way contradict the Islamic ideal of monotheism will probably be adopted if it has a value. If it had aesthetic value, if it had functional value, the likelihood is probably it would be adopted by the Muslims. So I suppose mosques were sort of a natural extension of a culture of openness. 